Hey everybody, welcome to Maker Camp. I'm Nick Raymond, the Camp Director. Today is Field Trip Friday. We've got an awesome program scheduled. Uh, today we'll be talking to Brianna Pogener. Uh, she's a paleoanthropologist who studies the prehistoric uh, behavior of uh, human diets. Uh, we also have Lise Lotoff, uh, best known for the creator of MacGyver. Uh, how's it going, guys? Welcome. Thanks for hanging out hey. with us. Hey. And then, as always, we have the Make Labs. We have uh, Jillian Benary and Eric Chu. Uh, they'll be taking your questions. So, uh, as always, if you have questions for us during the Hangout uh, for Brianna or Lee, uh, leave us a comment under the post. And uh, Jillian and Eric will take your comments, and uh, we'll get that going. So uh, before we go into the actual kind of what's going on, uh, Brianna, tell us about yourself, and uh, what is a paleoanthropologist? What is a paleoanthropologist? So that um, paleo basically means really old, and anthropologist is some who studies people. So I am somebody who studies really old people, um, and I specifically study the behavior of really old people. And um, let's see, tell them a little bit about myself. I, um, I have a secret that I can reveal right up front. I was not particularly into science when I was a kid. Um, and I really only found my passion for paleoanthropology after I got to college and had a really inspiring college professor. Awesome. And I should also note that you work at the Smithsonian, which is also the largest museum and research complex. Is that right? That's exactly right, and a lot of people don't know that the Smithsonian is not just a whole myriad of museums, but that there are a lot of researchers um, humming away like busy bees behind the scenes actually doing research at the Smithsonian also. And um, where are you right now? You have some, some skulls and some pretty cool objects in the background. Are you in a research lab right now? I do. I am in the research lab of the Human Origins Program at the National Museum of Natural History right on the mall in downtown Washington, D.C. Awesome. And uh, Lee, it looks like you're a little hot over there. You're uh, you're coming from Southern California, is that right? There's a yeah, heat wave um, going on. I'm in Southern California, and we are experiencing a heat wave. And uh, being that tools are not perfect things, my air conditioning quit. So, <laughs> so if you see sweat dripping down my face, it's not because I'm nervous. It's just because I'm hot. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us. And uh, Brianna, do you want to lead into uh, kind of what we're talking about today? Sure. So um, I'm going to talk about tools, what makes human-made tools unique, and what we do with those tools, both as archaeologists and generally as human beings. So the first thing I want to do is just to get us thinking a little bit about what makes human tools unique is to show a video about what primates do um, to make stone tools. Primates, birds, um, other mammals use tools, and so we'll go right to that. Great. I forgot to mention that that was a silent video, so don't oh, worry, your audio okay. is not broken. <laughs> I thought my speakers were broken. <laughs> no, as everybody's holding their breath and going, why can't I hear anything? No. So there's two things that I really take away from that video. One is that um, humans make an amazing amount of tools or use an amazing amount of tools um, in their everyday life. 
And another thing is one thing that makes us unique is that we use tools to make other tools. So those are two of the many unique features of um, human-made technology. That technology really started very simply um, from basically taking a rock, usually a round rock, a hammer stone, um, striking a flake off of a stone core. So you want to look for a core that has particular features, that has um, a particular angles, and then you get if you do that you get a sharp flake and that flake and potentially also that core um, are some of the earliest tools and these are replicas of some of the earliest tools in the world um, known from northern Kenya so um, it doesn't it didn't take very much in the beginning um, to make um, tools that could be used for slicing things cutting things sharpening sticks um, you could even use hammer stones to break open bones to get at um, nice delicious bone marrow um, but probably what early humans were getting after or were going after were sharp flakes that they could use to then slice meat off of bones and so those were some of our earliest tools um, and those are really tied into early diet so when we're saying uh, like prehistoric humans, um, what kind of time span are we looking at? Are we looking at, like, um, I know that I have a uh, family cabin and I've found, like, arrowheads and pieces of flint or um, obsidian. Is that the same time period? Or are we going way back? We are going way back. So in North America, we have uh, stone tool technology and evidence for early human habitation that goes back maybe 15-ish thousand years ago. But these early stone tools go back about two and a half million years ago. Uh, there's even potential um, that some of this goes back beyond three million years. That evidence is a little bit contentious, but we know by at least about 2.6, 2.5 million years ago that early humans were making and using some um, stone tool technology. Crazy. And how how do we uh, how do we date those kind of things? How is it like carbon dating or what's the process? Uh, there's uh, dozens of different kinds of dating techniques okay. that we can use. Um, carbon dating actually only goes back about 40,000 years. Oh. So what, what we typically use for some of the earliest stone tool technology is um, different kinds of dating of volcanic ash. So a lot of times you don't actually date the object. I wouldn't say, okay, I want to know how old this object is because it's, you would be dating the actual rock not dating the time in which the rock was flaked. Right. So right. You can, that's a little confusing, but what you can do is if you find some of these stone tools deposited in layers between volcanic ash layers, if you have a volcanic ash layer below, you have a volcanic ash layer above, and you can look at the ratios of different isotopes to get a pretty good date on those layers, then you can say, okay, we know these tools are between, let's say, 2.1 and 2.2 million years ago. So we actually date the context. Context is super important in paleoanthropology. We date the context of the tool, not the tool itself. Okay, so it's not just the tool. Um, and can you also go into, Brianna, what is an isotope? Um, and why would you want to look up what the isotopes or how many isotopes there are? Sure. Actually, you know, one of the things that um, I'm going to talk about that, that um, I will talk about is... Um, uh, um, uh, I, sorry, isotopes are basically um, different elements decay into some into other elements at different rates so okay. you can get um, an isotope of a particular element that that decays into you can get uranium decay sorry potassium decaying into uranium um, and that decay happens at different rates and when those uh, isotopes when those elements change that change happens at a particular rate so it's really it's kind of a complicated chemical um, process and interaction cool thank you so uh, what kind of technologies do you also use um, just in your research kind of on a daily basis? I know you do a lot of um, excavation, so you do a lot of field research in Kenya and Tanzania, um, and then you also have, I'm guessing, lab procedures. Um, are there interesting new kind of tools that you use in the field and back in the lab? Yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about what I use personally in my research, and then I'll talk a little bit more about some, what some of my colleagues use. So I use some pretty... Um, really exciting sophisticated technology like um, sh sharp pointy objects to be able to dig <laughs> things out of the ground. Um, very basic tools, probably not, you know, I could probably use early stone tools to actually dig other stone tools out of the ground. Um, but I use anything from awls to dental picks if we're digging up things that are really particularly um, uh, friable or uh, breakable um, or fragile. 
um, brushes in order to brush away sediment as we're doing excavations, um, trowels that we can also use to scrape away dirt as we're doing excavations. So there's a whole variety of tools that we use on excavations. And I, I have to give a plug to a tool that most people don't think about, the field notebook. Oh. Um, so one of the things that's really important is to actually be actually document everything that we see. So we record everything, and I'll, I'll actually give you a little sample of this close up. Um, we record everything that we excavate in three-dimensional coordinates. So we use um, some sophisticated, more sophisticated than paintbrushes. We use sophisticated <laughs> um, <laughs> um, laser transit technology in order to plot each object in three dimension so that when we pull it out of the ground, we know exactly where it came from because, as I mentioned, that context is key. If you're dating different volcanic ashes or um, using other kinds of dating techniques, it's really important to know exactly where an object came from to figure out how old it is. Um, when I'm in the lab, mostly what I use is magnifying technology. Um, so I use jeweler's loops or hand lenses, mm -hmm. um, and that gives you a little sense of what that looks like. It's just, um, it's just um, uh, a magnifying glass that lets us look at something a lot closer up. So I can use that to look for tiny little cut marks on objects. You can see those a little bit. Um, if you zoom in a little bit, there are some scratch marks right here on this right. particular on this phone. So you can see that. So that is this this is a real fossil. So I'm holding evidence of behavior from about a million years ago. Wow. Um, so I can yeah, it's really exciting every time I get to touch one of these fossils. So I use those jewelers loops or even just regular magnifying glasses. Um, but I also want to pull up a video that lets us talk about what other kinds of more sophisticated technology paleoanthropologists use in our jobs. In my research, I use a host and a range of scanning technologies. And by that, I mean uh, everything from laser scanners to CT scanners to MRI. Uh, basically, data that's acquired using advanced technology. Uh, but that what it does is it translates the information about the object into uh, a digitized form. So I can pull it up on my computer. I can spin it around. I can take measurements in ways that uh, I can't do on the actual object. And so it really is a liberating uh, uh, ability to be able to then take more measurements from the scans without having to handle the object itself anymore. And uh, in my research, I, I use it extensively. Essentially what happens is as the laser goes across the surface, a sensor captures that information of where the laser is contacting the surface. And from that, it translates that information into a digital model so that we essentially create a digital cast of the object that then we can have inside the computer and when that object has to go back away or even in some cases back in the ground we still have a full three-dimensional copy of it and uh, that's a phenomenal tool for research and education. We actually have a scanning electron microscope or SEM and so we're able to uh, prepare the specimens, the bones that we want to look at or the edges of stone tools that we want to look at and we're able to then take the the molds and casts of those and the powerful scanning electron microscope sends electron beams over the edges of those things, over the surfaces, and able to create just these beautiful images at high microscopic power. With laser scanning, it essentially just captures the outer surface because the laser can't see inside the bone, whereas CT scanning actually sees inside the bone as well. So they're complementary technologies. Paleoanthropologists, we use whatever is available to us, and whether that happens to be a dental pick or your bare hands at times to the most expensive uh, technological equipment out there. Anything that can help address a question uh, is useful. And uh, if it, especially if it can help address a question in a new and novel way, then you can bet uh, uh, an anthropologist is going to try and get their hands on it to do it. So that gives you a sense that we use both pretty simple and basic and also really sophisticated technology as paleoanthropologists. Yeah, that's crazy. I can't believe you guys use like laser scanners uh, to make those 3D models. Um, I actually have a similar one. Um, we have a 3D printer here at, uh, at Make, and if you go on, I think it's the website Thingiverse, someone's actually scanned... Um, I think like a similar skull that you have there. Those are those are real, actually, aren't they, Rihanna? These are casts. So the well, real the objects. Yep. So these are casts. Um, but we uh, we also use three D scanning and printing to make uh, replicas of objects. Yeah, it's crazy how much detail you can get. Um, I don't know if you can see in the camera, but you have all of these kind of cavities um, 
that show up. Um, and then we print it upside down, obviously, to, to make it work. Um, but yeah, that's a lot of detail you can get just from like an actual skull if you have it already on hand. Exactly. So Lee, um, what sort of ideas have you had to think of or come up with um, for tools when writing for MacGyver and just, you know, in your life? Um, well, Brianna so obviously some of the simpler stuff. And some yeah, laser thought, scanning, but... I, actually, I thought one of the most interesting things in that last video was, was when one of those gentlemen said, the way this starts is by trying to ask a new question. All right? And so... Certainly, you know, in the creating of MacGyver, um, and, and to do a shameless plug, the, the MacGyver comic book is coming out in October, but at the back of the comic book, in, in five segments, I tell the story of how MacGyver, how the, the character MacGyver actually came to be. So, so soon that will be out there. I think it's coming out in October. Anyway, um, and, the, and so, you know, in creating something like a MacGyver character, the first question was, well, how do you make this character different or unique? And, and the notion at some point in the, in the process was, well, if you took away his gun, then he couldn't just shoot everybody. He'd have to come up with some other way of doing things. And, <clears throat> you know, James Bond already kind of had all those neat toys, you know, that Q gives him at the beginning of every Bond movie. Right. And, and then you wait until he pulls it out and uses it and say, well, suppose we had a character who didn't have a gun, so he can't just shoot everybody, <laughs> and he didn't have the toys. That meant he was going to have to figure out some other way to solve the problem. Um, and that became what I like to call vernacular technology, which is, what do you got? You know, what's around you? And, and to, to really look at your circumstances and say, okay, what is the problem, or what is the threat, or what is the challenge? What do I have, <clears throat> and is there a way that I can use what I have to, you know, to confront this this challenge or this threat or this problem? Um, now, obviously, when you're writing a TV show, you kind of make up the problem and put the things there that you want, so you can kind of have a fun and cool solution. But, <laughs> but, what really goes to the heart of tool making is the notion of what is a tool what makes something a tool and maybe maybe uh, Brianna you could talk to that a little bit and then sure. we're gonna come back to more MacGyver stuff when <laughs> you when you sort of laid out how do you know that something's a tool Sure, absolutely. And actually, we have a great video again silent that shows some of the differences between um, just broken rocks and tools, and then I'll get into a little bit of more about how we tell. I think it's interesting, by the way, that I'm in the entertainment business and she's the one with all the videos. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so you can see one of the most important things about um, identifying when a t when you find a tool in prehistoric context is you want to look for. Um, well, you can watch Dr. John Shea um, as he's doing some flint napping, but you want to look for um, those flake scars. You can see he's about to bring a hammerstone down um, onto the core, and when he removes the flake, you see a scar. And so I'll show you some of those after the video's over on some of the, the real stone tools we have here. But another thing that's really important that you saw in the beginning of that video is that there are many stone tools in one place. So a lot of times, we will have people come to us and say, oh, I think I found this stone tool in my backyard, or I think I found this stone tool out in this riverbed. And we say, well, there's a lot of other rolled cobbles around, or there's a lot of other broken rocks around. And what you really want to look for is not only the shape, as Dr. Shea is pointing out in this video, of a particular tool, but you want to look for um, a whole multiple, uh, a whole host of stone tools that you find in the same place at the same time. And that's a really big clue that what you're looking at is a stone tool and not just a broken rock. And interestingly, what, what Dr. Shea is making now um, is either a hand axe or even a more sophisticated tool, um, which is a, a, a stone point that Neanderthals would have. There's a good shot of lots and lots of stone tools in one place. 
So it's really tough at the dawn of technology. It's a lot harder to see flake scars um, on really small objects where on small objects and also objects that look kind of like broken rock sometimes um, in the, for the earliest stone tools they only had flakes taken off of one side of the core so you may get one part of the core oh that just looks like a broken rolled cobble but on the other side of the core maybe one or two sides you get these flake scars taken off once you get to slightly more sophisticated stone tools then you can see flake scars much easier so you can mm -hmm. see on this hand axe, this is a real hand axe, it's about a million years old. Um, on this hand axe you can see these flake scars and they're often overlapping flake scars. So there was one flake taken off, then another flake taken off, then another flake taken off. So the other thing that you start to see is you really start to see tools being shaped much more finely. This is the first innovation in stone tool technology. So these are, this is a hand axe and a hand axe is a teardrop shaped rock that's been flaked on two sides. Um, and this, uh, our ancestors from about two and a half to maybe one and a half million years ago, they were going along just fine making these um, unifacially flaked tools. Probably what they really wanted to do was get sharp edges off and that sharp edge is what allowed them to access meat and other resources. But about a million years ago they started making these teardrop shaped hand axes and this was innovation in stone tool technology. Interestingly, we're not entirely sure what these hand axes were used for. There's one idea that hand axes were used basically as flake dispensers so that they were, um, you, could, you could basically take a flake, um, sorry, take a, um, take a hand axe and knock multiple flakes off of it and that what they were still going for was those sharp edges but that this was an efficient way to use more of the raw material, the stone raw material that you get. Uh, it's very possible, and this is an experimentally made hand axe. It's also possible that it was the hand axe itself that was the tool. So you can use the sharp edge of a hand axe for scraping. You can use it for, use it for um, chopping wood. You can potentially use it for breaking open um, a nice juicy leg bone of an animal to get at marrow, as you saw with that other video. So um, I like to think of these Paleolithic um, hand axes as really... Um, uh, sort of the first multi-purpose tools that humans ever used. You were kind enough not to mention that you might also be able to use it as a weapon to whack your enemy over the head so you could steal <laughs> his much prettier woman than the woman you happen to have, right? <laughs> well, you know, anything is possible with these, um, you know, Swiss army knives of the Paleolithic and whether you wanted to use them to do good or to do evil, uh, it's very possible. We don't have, it's interesting, we don't have evidence for um, sort of interpersonal warfare or humans using these tools on each other. We do have some evidence for cannibalism much later in time, but not really with the origin of stone tool technology. And so do stone tool technology go hand in hand with fire and cooking meat? I know uh, some of the research you were doing involves the, the diet of the prehistoric humans and a lot of it has to do with meat and eating meat and, and cutting the meat off the bone. Um, did we always cook our meat? That, that's a really good question. So as I mentioned before, the origin of stone tool technology, making of stone tools, goes back about 2.5, 2.6 million years, maybe even longer. But the earliest evidence we have for the controlled use of fire only goes back about 800,000 years ago. So either our ancestors butchered and ate raw meat for an awfully long time or we simply haven't found the evidence for the controlled use of fire that goes back as early as our evidence for making stone tools and eating meat. Yum. And how <laughs> has the tools kind of progressed? <laughs> how have the tools kind of progressed? Um, you have the hand axe as the example. Was was there a later innovation, or does is that the, the, that's the pinnacle of stone tools? <laughs> no, thankfully, not the pinnacle of stone tools. Um, so, as with um, cell phones, is a great example of modern tools. Um, with early tools, uh, tools got smaller and smaller. So, after hand axes, you have points. Um, so, these are tools that were. Uh, kind of also shaped like hand axes but they were much smaller, they were much more finely shaped. Uh, people began to use nicer raw material, they started walking longer distances to get finer grain raw material which you can use to make into really um, and really uh, well shaped objects. And then 
the pinnacle of stone tool technology really before you get to um, modern times when we use a whole lot of different metal and other kinds of materials to make stone tools are very small blades. Um, uh, the definition of a blade is it's a stone tool that is twice as, at least twice as long as it is wide. These were probably, actually most likely hafted, so they were tied onto some kind of a stick. Um, that's probably not the best, but they were tied onto some kind of a stick. Um, they were hafted using some kind of sticky substance. They may have also been uh, literally tied on there. This is bow and arrow technology. That doesn't happen until maybe um, within, you know, 20-ish thousand years ago. So um, uh, another thing that we find in tool technology, I can't say stone tool technology, is that we have found things like thrusting spears and throwing spears back in the archaeological record maybe about 300, 400,000 years ago. Um, unfortunately, wood doesn't preserve nearly as well as stone. That's why most of the evidence that we have for tool technology is in the form of stone. But we know that early humans were using spears to hunt animals back by, by about three or 400,000 years ago. But I think, to jump in for a second, Nick, I, th I think the question about <clears throat> when we started using fire to cook meat is a really interesting question because... Um, there's some evidence, and Brianna can probably can probably talk to this with a lot more intelligence and detail than I can. But, but, so when you eat raw meat, it takes a lot of energy from your body to actually break it down. When you cook the meat, you actually get a lot more nutrients out of the food without having to take so much energy out of you because you've actually broken it down to a certain extent by using the fire. So once that starts to happen, it, it enables the possibility of going further, in other words, going further afield to look for things because you're not burning up so much energy just digesting, digesting. the food you're consuming. And it also allows the possibility of increased brain power at right. that point because you're getting a lot more nutrient from the same amount of material just because you're able to cook it. Is that right, Brianna? Is that sound That's right? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So it's likely that um, fire afforded us several things. One is exactly breaking down food a lot quicker and more efficiently so you could get uh, more nutrients out of the same packet of food, basically out of the same amount of meat. Um, also, it cooking helps to kill parasites, so it was likely that we were able to um, eat more meat from different sources. We were probably scavenging, certainly in the beginning um, of our meat-eating adventures. We were scavenging meat probably from large carnivores, and I can talk a little bit more about that. Um, and another thing it does is it allows us to access food sources that we simply wouldn't have access to. So I happen to be interested in and study the origin and evolution of meat eating, but plants were inevitably hugely important throughout um, human evolutionary history, and we're getting more and more evidence of how um, our early human ancestors ate a variety of plants. So cooking allows us to eat plants that we couldn't have eaten before and get nutrients out of those plants, more nutrients. Um, and I'll also talk a little bit about something called the expensive tissue hypothesis. So Lee, you mentioned about being able to get bigger brains. There's a hypothesis out there that says that um, our brain size really could only increase once we were eating meat and other um, kind of high, um, high, uh, ef very efficient packets of energy because the two most expensive organs in your body, your brain and your gut. Um, and uh, our primate, closest living primate relatives like chimpanzees and gorillas have very barrel shaped guts. They have really big um, gut organs. And once we started eating more meat and more high quality resources, we were able to actually devote more, less energy into growing our guts and potentially more energy into growing our brains. And interestingly, <laughs> it's right at the same, around the same time period, around 800,000 years ago, that's when we first see the origin of the controlled use of fire. It's also when we see an, a really steep increase in brain size. So brain size is increasing as body size is increasing human ancestor fully over time, and then all of a sudden about 800,000 years ago, it kicks up. So it may have been the um, use of fire to cook meat and other food that allows us to grow such big brains. 
Is there any chance that there, there was a different correlation? Of, I'm sure you've thought plenty about that or that the causation goes the other way. Absolutely. It's very possible that um, the causation goes the other way. And it's, we can, a lot of times in the past, it's a little frustrating, but, but also exciting because it helps you ans ask new research questions. You can look at correlation, but we can't tell which way the causation goes. So absolutely, that's possible. So to, just to clarify what you're saying, it may have been that the brain got big enough to say, hey, you know, we should have fire and start cooking things. <laughs> as opposed well, exactly. to we started cooking things because we had fire and the brain got bigger, right? That's what that you were That very saying. well could be. It very well could be that, you know, some of the, the and, and we have to think about things always in the, in the sense of evolutionary fitness. So is a behavior going to become fixed because it helps us reproduce and produce more offspring? So if it was our ancestors that started using fire, they were able to maybe reproduce quicker, they were able to attract more mates, and for whatever reason, that behavior really stuck. Also, who doesn't like to sit around a fire at night? I mean, it's a whole lot more interesting well, than just sitting around in the dark, you know? <laughs> That's exactly right. And the other thing that fires probably afforded us, not only to um, uh, a kind of a social aspect to be able to hang out and, like we're doing now, uh, and sit around <laughs> and, and talk about, tell our, our awesome hunting stories and the, the things that we conquered that day, um, but fires probably afforded us uh, a way to be able to ward off predators and a way to be able to keep warm at night. So it's also not until after we see people controlling fire that we that our ancestors moved into much colder environments and higher latitudes. Hmm. So Brianna, you also do uh, sort of like field research, right, in I different do. parts of the world. I do. So mostly I work in Eastern Africa, in Kenya and Tanzania. I've done some work in Indonesia as well and in South Africa. And do you always bring the same set of tools or is it more like a camping expedition? Uh, you have your right. own campfires at night or how does that work? <laughs> we do actually sometimes sit around the campfire at night. So um, if you can bring up pictures, let's start with um, some tent pictures. Um, so when I go into the field in the summers, I am living in a tent. Um, this okay. is my home, away from home, for usually two to three months in the summer. Wow. Um, you can see it's a pretty nice tent. I can stand up in it. It's a nice canvas tent. It um, yeah. reflects the heat very well. Um, so there's another picture of me inside the tent. Uh, there's, it's even big enough for me to have tables, um, so wow. I can do some work there. And this is the beautiful um, sunset at our excavations in southern Kenya at Alor Gasaili. And um, that's another view. And you can see I'm even, I have a laptop, and I'll talk a little bit about how we possibly are able to use laptops in the field, because those tools are very important when we're recording a lot of data in a short amount of time. Um, let's bring up the solar panels and solar battery pictures. So 21st century tools are really important to us, like um, digital cameras like laptops and other things that are battery powered. So we are able to use these solar panels um, to collect energy from the sun and on the equator um, in uh, there's a lot of sun, a lot more than there is here, although DC has been awfully hot and humid and we've been getting a lot of sun lately. So we use solar panels in order to collect energy from the sun. It goes to a um, solar battery and then we can invert that power, exactly, we can invert that power and then um, use it to charge our electronics and so it's really helpful in order to be able to use our those kinds of tools. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of the fun of being out, um, being a prehistoric archaeologist. Let's bring up the bathroom series of pictures. This is a question that I get so often. Um, how do you go to the bathroom in the field? So we have some long drops. You can go to the next one. Um, and you, if you were oh, to open our bathroom door, you can see inside. And you can go to the next one. Um, and you can see we have a lovely toilet seat. We have a lot of toilet paper. You can go to the next picture. <laughs> um, and when you're finished doing your business in the bathroom, you take sand and ash that we have left over from our fire, uh, put it down our long drop. Um, the most important tool we have in our bathroom adventures is our bathroom flag. So if, especially in the middle of the night or if, um, you know, you're waiting in line to go to the bathroom, you need to know if someone's in there. You put the flag up if someone's in the bathroom. You must remember to put the flag down if you leave the bathroom. If you're the person that forgets and leaves the flag up, you're going to be the most unpopular person in camp. <laughs> 
Very cool. And so do you set up camp for an extended period of time, or is it you set up camp for a couple of days and you move to a new site, uh, set up camp, move site? You know, How does that work? We do mostly we do the former. So mostly it's we set up camp at the same spot every year and we stay there for several weeks, usually between six and eight weeks. Um, but sometimes if we're doing excavations that are too far away to drive to, we could set up a fly camp. So we'll take just basic um, camping equipment, maybe a little bit of kitchen equipment, um, and we can set up camp for a couple days at a time. But usually it takes so much effort to get all of your tools, all of your personnel, all of your people, and all of your equipment out there that it makes sense to really just try to camp central to where you're doing your excavations. And have there been, um, kind of with the stone tools, have you found yourself using your tools the last couple of years to do your research, or has it really just stuck to you know, the, the brush and the pick um, for just the basics? And you know, the answer would be both. So we, away from the brush and the pick and the you know, dental pick and using um, technology, laser transits, which I mentioned before, which enable us to plot specimens in three dimensions. Um, those came out maybe two decades ago or so, and so we've been using those for about the past 15 plus years. Um, certainly we're using um, digital cameras in ways that we never did before, although one thing I would like to mention, this is kind of a neat thing, is that not only do we use digital cameras, but we can um, use Polaroid cameras, and I'm going to open up to picture in a field notebook where we've pasted a picture of a Polaroid, uh, a Polaroid picture, and you can even draw pictures. So a lot of times you can, um, actually I'll put this down here, might be easier to see. So um, you can actually oh. trace the outline of beds and you can um, label features in Polaroid pictures, so even some technologies that are basically being phased out today um, are things that we're still using on our excavation. So it's a really neat combination of um, old technology and new technology. Brianna, I have a question that, that um, came up earlier. I think it was from one of the first videos where they were talking about the 3D scanning of objects that you might sometimes have to replace into the ground. Under what circumstances would you ever do that? Um, objects that we would have to place into the ground. I don't remember the context of that in the video, so I'm actually not sure what oh, that was, was referring to. He was to. talking about the reasons one would 3D scan one of the skulls or an artifact that you found, and it's so you can have a copy of it, or sometimes it has to go back into the ground. Oh, okay. I'm wondering oh, so, why. <laughs> so what's the story of that? So um, there is a very significant repatriation effort, as it's called, especially in North America, where there are... Um, uh, groups of people who lay claim to um, skeletal material that they say that these are our ancestors. Um, this happens a lot out of Native American tribes. And so sometimes museums like the Smithsonian are actually giving those skeletal materials back to people and, the, and, the, and they say we want to bury these ancestors of ours. So uh, we, that uh, 3D scanning is a way that we can actually keep the scientific information from an object while actually letting the, um, while giving the object back to um, people who have laid claim to it. Oh, that's really interesting. It's and not so always wait, finders to... keepers. <laughs> <laughs> it's not always finders keepers, that's absolutely right. Well, and it's interesting, the reason that I have my um, friends here who are casts or replicas of early human skulls is because the people who found them don't get to keep them. The countries where they are found get to keep them. So um, my friends Australopithecus, Africanus, Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalensis are actually um, in the countries of their origin. So that's why we don't have the actual fossils here. What are the... What are you, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jillian. No, I was just curious about burying bones, and I mean, we all bury our ancestors too, and under what circumstances do, do the bones get preserved, like in Africa, the ones that you dig up, and which ones don't? That's a really good question. So the first thing, if you want to become a fossil, the first thing you need to do to get preserved is to get buried. So um, if, you, if a bone is laying out on the surface, it will usually get destroyed by a variety of physical and chemical weathering processes. So you want it to get buried, and it also is usually the right set of minerals in the surrounding soil. So all a fossil is, a fossil is a rock, but it's a rock that um, has, it, it takes on special properties because it is the remains of um, bone or solid material from a skeleton. 
So you need particular minerals in the soil in order to replace um, the minerals that were in that living organism. You also need it to be a fairly um, dry and um, uh, not too cold or not too hot environment in which the preservation happens because um, being too wet or being too cold and freezing and cracking can destroy bones. Um, being Getting alternately wet and dry can also destroy bones so there's it has to be a pretty good um, environment in order for fossilization or preservation to happen. Hmm. Good to know. Thank you. Yep. I'm also curious, uh, Lee, kind of going back to MacGyver, um, we've heard Brianna and the progression of the tools that she's not only found but kind of using for her research. Um, when writing MacGyver, did you kind of, MacGyver was on for about seven series, uh, seven seasons, right, on ABC? Um, yeah. Did you find that you would have a progression of tools you would come back to and use or, um, you know, new tools would come out or new technology would come out and you would write about that as well? I mean, what was what was your well, kind of Okay, process? so, so um, I created MacGyver in that I was the guy who wrote the pilot and, and sort of created the blueprint for the show. I did not actually stay with the series or, or continue running the series. That was done by, you know, other writers and producers and what are called showrunners. Um, however, um, the way the, I did, in fact, use, uh, you know, a consultant uh, and consultants when I was coming up with the original pilot of, of, okay, what kind of things could we use and what could we do with it? And, and I did, in fact, you know, give the consultant, as it were, to the showrunners so that they would have somebody to use because I would get these really angry calls like, you know, you did this thing in the pilot and the network wants us to do this every week and this stuff is hard, you know, and it's like it's one thing to come up with stories, it's another thing to come up with, you know, nine cool things you're going to do with the safety pin, okay? <laughs> so I said, don't worry, I'll give you these, this consultant and he'll help you and in fact he did. There, I think there were, in the course of the series, there were two main guys one was named John Koivula, who was the guy I started with, and, uh, and another guy named John Potter, who I now work with extensively when I'm working on other MacGyver projects, um, came on board. And so really what, what dr generated that, certainly in the pilot and I'm sure in the series, was, okay, what's going to make for an interesting situation? What are the technologies that are coming up that we can use? I mean... Keep in mind, MacGyver happened long before there were cell phones, long before there was a you know, and much of it, anything that resembled the internet we have today. Okay, so part of the fun and the challenge of that show is how can we use really simple objects in really kind of high tech situations. In fact, in the pilot, he's in this you know he's in this super high tech facility that's kind of gone haywire and there are people trapped down in the bottom of it by an explosion and he's got to go down you know work his way down through this kind of multi-leveled facility and of course none of the technology that made this thing so whiz-bang is available to him in fact in a lot of cases he's got to use kind of really dumb technology to overcome you know the super technology because it doesn't want to let him get through um, so it was kind of the fun of saying okay let's let's look at the most high-end technology we can imagine and now put a guy in there and he, not only can he use any of it, he mm -hmm. has to kind of get around it by using, you know, uh, I mean, in one case, he, you know, he's got to use a water hose, uh, a fire hose to create pressure to move something, you know, off something else so he can get through or, you know, it's like that. And it was figured that would kind of be the fun. So it was always about sort of playing off against the modern technology, obviously, in all the new MacGyver stuff that that is coming, going to be coming out over the next couple of years, we've updated it to incorporate, you know, cell phones and computers and the internet and all that stuff. But but um, but that relationship of of you know who we are to our technology is a really key relationship. And in fact, even though it looks like it's stone tools and raw meat. Really, that's what Brianna has been talking about, was what's the relationship between us and the stuff around us, and at what point does it become tools or technology, you know? And, and at the end of the day, the real tool, the ultimate tool, is our brain. 
it, every tool that's out there, whether it's a hammer or a saw or a stone tool, really comes about because somebody of mind looks at that and says, wait a minute, I can use this somehow. I want to get inside those bones. If I pick up this rock, I can smash open the bones. I can get inside the bones. But it starts with the mindset of a thought of saying, how do I get inside the bone? It's asking the right question and then saying, how do I answer that question? So the notion of tool making being, you know, we know now it's obviously not just humans because there are animals that come up with tools. I think one of the things that makes us so different is we have this clearly larger brain. And the more our brain sort of pushes at these questions that face us, the more we have to kind of invent new sorts of tools. And tools aren't necessarily just physical objects. There are lots of different kinds of tools. There are psychological tools. There are emotional tools. There are social tools. And these things don't have matter, you know, but that doesn't make them any less tools. <laughs> they can still be used in a situation if you say, I've got this problem, I've got this situation, I've got this issue, and I want to get from here to there. And you start looking around and you're saying, well, what could I use to get there? I'll tell you a short story, okay? So I was in middle school. I had just transferred into a new school. I was kind of a stranger. Nobody really liked me. Nobody knew me. I was an outcast. I was alone, okay? And it was kind of miserable because I had no friends. My parents, for some reason, I think, bought a guitar for me because they think, this kid needs something to do. Sure. They tried to give me <laughs> classes of guitar lessons. That never really got anywhere. But eventually I said, you know what? I'm not spending my time with other people. I'm mostly by myself. Here's this guitar. I might as well learn to play the damn thing, right? So I taught myself how to play the guitar. And I would play the guitar for hours a day because there was nothing else to do. I'd go to school. I'd come home. I'd watch some TV. This was long before there were such things as video games or the Internet. I'd play the guitar. I lived close to the beach. One day, I'm down at the beach playing my guitar because that's what I would do. And a girl from my school wanders by, and she sits down, and she listens to me play the guitar. And she says, you know, you're pretty good at playing the guitar. I said, well, I got nothing else to do, basically. <laughs> the next thing I know, they start inviting me to parties. Why? Because they want me to bring my guitar and play the guitar. And by the way, there's nothing, nothing fuels romance better than music, particularly playing <laughs> the guitar for somebody. So within like a year, I had more friends than I knew what to do with. I was the most popular kid around, and I had <laughs> girls coming out of, you know, every door. Why? Because I looked at the situation and said, so long as I'm alone and I'm isolated, I might as well do something with this time and do something that I love. And you do something that love, and guess what? Turns out other people are probably going to find you. So was there a tool there? I guess you could say the guitar was a tool, but I didn't really think of it as a tool. <laughs> the tool was... What's the problem? What can I do to address it? And how does that transform the situation? Well, so Brianna, what tools did you start with uh, to get into paleoanthropology? I mean, were you just like an outdoorsy kid and you loved to go camping and you found fossils in your backyard? Or how did, how did you start with that? <laughs> None of any of that, interestingly. I was not a particularly outdoorsy kid. Um, I had never been camping before I went to do my first field work, and that was a really harrowing experience. I didn't know how to set up a tent. I didn't know how to do any of this stuff. Um, but I found, I really fell in love with the field work and the outdoors and excavations and discovery and adventure when I first got to experience it. But it wasn't, again, it wasn't until college. It wasn't until I got to, I first set foot on the African continent that I said, oh my gosh, this is the place where I want to be and this is where I want to do my work and do my research and build my career. Um, and I love what Lee was talking about before. It's really like it's that spirit of innovation that is um, what makes humans really unique as far as tool making and, and just about everything else that we do. Brianna, what advice would you give for kids who are watching that would be interested in getting into paleoanthropology or just anthropology? 
Well, I would say, um, you know, read up on it is a great thing to do. Seek out internships in museums. Um, see if you can contact local professors. Um, another thing you can do if you're particularly interested like I am in trying to figure out what early humans were doing when they were first um, eating meat, you can bring up, um, let's see, um, oh, if you bring up Car and Dead Zebra, I can show you a little bit. That sounds like a fun picture. Yeah. Um, so, so what I did for part of my dissertation research is I um, was working on a game reserve in Kenya where I was looking for remains that um, lions and other animals had eaten. And you can bring up the picture that is um, lion eating zebra. Um, so I would go to kills after lions had um, eaten particular animals. Um, I would put them in the back of my truck, as you saw, and then I would clean them off and I would study the tooth marks that are made on those bones. Well, you don't have to go to Africa and follow lions around to do that. You can do that with, um, you can eat ribs. Um, you can, you know, take, get barbecue and you can look at what human tooth marks look like. You can feed bones to your animals, to your dogs. I, I don't want anybody to have choking dogs after watching this. Um, but you can um, do some some things with your own pets or with other animals looking at how dogs gnaw on bones um, and so and you can take stone sharp stone you can take metal knives and you can make marks on bones and you can get a sense of just how scientists would make a comparative collection in order to then look at the fossil record and try to figure out early human behavior and should you just go onto some land or property and start digging around for fossils, or is there an actual, <laughs> is there a protocol for doing this kind of thing? <laughs> you should not go onto land or property and start okay. digging around for fossils. <laughs> no, I'm glad, I'm glad you asked because you know, being a uh, sort of an archaeological or, or uh, an amateur archaeologist or an archaeology enthusiast, you would think that oh, I just want to go start looking for stuff. No, there's definitely um, you would have to look into your state archaeologist's office, look for getting permits, um, and most of the time what you would really want to do is team up with a professional archaeologist um, in order to do something like that. I'm glad you asked that question. And, and professional archaeologists love free labor. Yes, so, yes, so thank you. You Liz. volunteer Please. yourself to like dig somewhere or sweep right. or clean. And we call you it being a shovel bum. A job. That's right. That's exactly you know what? right. Is it Brianna? A shovel bum. Shovel bum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, getting out there with a shovel and you know um, bumming around for the summer, so maybe that's maybe some of um, you who are watching this. Maybe you'll want to um, team up with an archaeologist and and have some fun next summer. And is that something that you could find out probably like a local college or just kind of how would if you want to find someone like that? How would you network? Yep. So I would go on to the Archaeological Institute of America AIA website. Um, look for your state archaeologist, you could start okay. there. You can also look for the Society for American Archaeology has um, information about education and outreach and volunteer and other kinds of opportunities. You can also call your local university or college and if they have an anthropology department which is the discipline under which archaeology usually sits, then you can see if there's an archaeologist who is doing a local excavation and needs some volunteers for the summer or during the year depending on where, you, where you're located. And then what else are you currently working on, Brianna? Do you have any current projects you're uh, working on that you haven't told us about already? Um, well, one of the things I'm working on is actually a more educational project. I am teaming up with uh, a couple of different scientists and some AP biology teachers trying to use human examples to teach evolution. Um, and so um, talking about human behavior, human anatomy, disease, and things that kind of face um, humans today, and using those as examples to teach in school. Um, and as far as my science research projects, um, I'm really continuing to look at some of the um, carnivore chewed and cut mark bones um, and trying to refine our idea of who got there first. Was it um, early humans that got to some of these animals first in the fossil record, or was it carnivores that got there first and we were just basically um, getting at their scraps? Hmm. Cool. And so if we want to learn more about your research, Brianna, or just get in contact with you, is there like a Google Plus page to get you at or more websites we could learn about? 
Yeah, if you go to humanorigins.si.edu, um, you can find me under the Human Origins Program team. Um, and you can, um, there's, that's just a taste of some of the research I'm doing. I'm also working at a, um, a modern human footprint site, an early modern human footprint site in, in Tanzania. I'm continuing to work at um, Olorga Sile, the Smithsonian research site in southern Kenya. But yeah, if you go to humanorigins.si.edu, um, you can find me there. Awesome. And Lee, how about you? What are you working on currently, and uh, where can we find more information out? Uh, okay, so um, I'm actually, believe it or not, uh, spending a fair amount of my time now reinvigorating the whole MacGyver character. Mm -hmm. So he's going to come back uh, first in a, in a comic book series, a uh, graphic novel, that'll be out uh, starting in October. Uh, we're working on a big budget feature with uh, New Line Cinema that will hopefully be out sometime next year. Um, then we're going to launch a MacGyver website, uh, hopefully, in the next couple of months. Uh, cool. And we're also talking about doing a MacGyver Foundation to, uh, to basically do uh, charitable works in the name of MacGyver around the world. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole slew of stuff about that. Um, before the website comes up, probably the best place to get news is, uh, is to either go on some of the MacGyver uh, pages on Facebook or okay. you can go to MacGyver Online, which is a website, a uh, big fan site right now, and uh, and the people who run that and I are working together to uh, to get ready to start launching this new site. So that's a good place to go and check things out because they have a lot of information there. Um, I'm also working on a slew of other kinds of projects, but but that's always because in my business you have to have many irons in the fire because you never know which one is going to get hot. So. <laughs> I also, I'm glad you mentioned Facebook. I want to make a plug for um, the Smithsonian's Human Origins Facebook page as well as our Twitter account at Human Origins. So if you're really interested in human origins, human evolution, prehistoric human behavior, that's where you can find out uh, the most recent hot discoveries in human evolution. Fantastic. Well, um, Brianna, anything else that we didn't cover from, uh, from your field? No, I think that's, I mean, there's lots more that we didn't cover, but I think that that is probably a good pl uh, place to stop unless anybody has any other questions. Yeah, Lee or uh, Jillian or Eric, do you have any more questions um, or comments? I have a question about the 3D scanning technology. Um, yeah. What are the benefits between the laser, tech, the laser scanning technology and the other um, technology where it actually scans inside the phone? The and why would scanning? you use one over the other? Um, well, it's interesting. We um, scientists are just beginning to kind of accept the 3D scanning and printing technology oh. as a way to make really good replicas that we can do things like take measurements from on fossils. So um, the the objects that I have in front of me were cast using traditional casting techniques, um, and I think probably a lot of scientists still think that these this is the best. Um, technique in order to get really fine detail because a lot of times when we do the 3D scanning and printing you still get a little bit of um, like slightly uneven surfaces and things that aren't exactly true to the original object so I think as that gets more and more refined um, we're going to see more and more of that in the scientific uh, community for research. But I, I, think, I think what he was fundamentally asking was the laser scanning stuff pretty much scans the surface of things mm -hmm. and the CT scans basically look inside. So it's the difference, if you go to the doctor, it's the difference between <clears throat> the doctor looking at you from the outside and saying, well, it looks like you might have this problem, but if we do x-rays or MRIs or CT scans, then we get this whole slew of additional information because we can actually see inside the body with these technologies, and we get, you know, and then we can go, oh, I thought it was this, but it's really that because the scan tells, tells me more than I can see with the naked eye. Would that be a good comparison? I think that's absolutely right. So being able to, I mean, obviously our, our skulls and other 3D, uh, three-dimensional objects that aren't filled in in the middle, um, you can really get at those with um, CT scanning and other technologies where you can look at intricacies of things that are hollow. Very cool. Well, uh, thank you again, Lee, uh, creator of MacGyver. Uh, also, I think you didn't mention, but um, you also wrote a column for us uh, for Make Magazine, didn't you? Yes, I, I guess for about four or five years I would write the, uh, the makeshift the makeshift column, right, where we, you would kind of be given a challenge and, and, and here's the situation and here's what you have to work with and then like MacGyver you kind of had to come up with an answer. But I think if I have a parting comment for everybody who might be watching this either now or in the future, <laughs> you are the best tool there is. 
And if you're in a situation, whether it's a physical situation or a psychological situation or emotional situation, you have tools at your disposal. And the first and best tool is you. And you have to look at the situation and say, what's wrong with this situation? Where do I really want to be? And what do I need from within myself to get to that place? Because chances are, if you sit down and you take the time to think this through, there's almost always an answer. Awesome. Well, well thank you, Lee, so much uh, for joining us. And thank you, Brianna um, from the Smithsonian, uh, paleoanthropologist. And as always, Jillian and Eric, thank you for joining us in the Hangout today. Thanks so much. Uh, this is you. really fun. That yeah, was Thanks. a good one. Um, we will be having the Junior Counselor Hangout today. So if you haven't signed up already, uh, you want to leave us a comment under this post, and we'll add you to our circles. And we'll be having uh, a Junior Counselor Hangout in about half an hour from now. And I'd also like to plug uh, tomorrow for Saturday, we're going to have a special event with Adam Savage. Uh, we're going to be going to his workshop, and I'll be interviewing Adam, uh, hanging out with him for a while, and that'll be at 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time. So uh, tune in for that. We'll have some posts and some reminders. Uh, but again, thank you, everyone, so much uh, for being here today and hanging out, and we will look forward to talking to you later. So thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you. Take care. Bye.